it's 4:45 in the afternoon, 70 degrees in November, and in this area, that's not good when the average temperature is 50 for that time of year. Right. And I'm on the phone with my wife, and I look over, and there he is at 36 yards. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, okay. What are you going to do? She's down. Let's go. Dude, I just shot a deer of a lifetime. Freaking smoked him. One with nature, and if you're a believer, one with God. Definitely gets your heart pumping. Boy, you are in trouble. Follow Obsession Podcast. All right, everybody, welcome back to another Fall Obsession Podcast episode. Our podcast is driven by Ridge Rock Hunt Company, and I will talk more about them at the conclusion of our episode. I'm Sam. I'm one of your podcast hosts. Appreciate you guys tuning in. On this week with one of our uh, Midwestern pro staffers, Mr. Michael Teepee. Welcome back to the podcast, man. Hey, man. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Always good to get on here and chat with our Fall Obsession staff. And I, I think this is actually my first podcast to, to have with you. You've been on yeah. here a couple times before, once with Drew, and then we, we turned your couch chat um, from a while back into a podcast, which was pretty cool. But um, my first time to sit down and talk with you, so I'm pretty excited. Yeah, me too. Yep. So I wanted to dive in and talk to you. I, we always like to keep our content on our podcast, you know, relevant to the season as best mm-hmm. we can and everything. And, you know, th- this year, I think I mentioned last week in our in our episode that this year has just been a killer year for, for our staff. And you are no exception to that either. Um, I know earlier in the year you laid down a nice buck and you just put down a second nice buck. Uh, was it this morning or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, this morning, yeah, we're recording this podcast on November 11th. Yeah. And I uh, laid down the first one on an evening hunt on the 3rd of November. And so, yeah, eight days apart. Uh, obviously, you guys seen the video of the reduction zone doe back in the mid-September. And that was so I could actually um, earn my reduction zone buck tag, which is what I harvested on November 3rd. Yeah. Gotcha. So that, uh, we'll start there with that buck, because that buck, he looked very unique. He had some, some, some splits and some of his tines and everything. He was just, he was a very cool looking deer. Lots of character is what it looked like to me from the photos. Had you been watching that buck or was it just out of the blue? Yeah, actually I had been watching that buck. Um, I passed him up last year. Uh, there was a really nice deer that I was in there after that I had a couple years worth of experience with, um, actually have one of his set or one not a set but one of his sides of his sheds from 2020 uh that one side oh i i should remember this now i want to say that one side was 80 some inches wow uh he was a big one um i was guessing him at five at least at that time in 2020 then i hunted him last year never got to lay eyes on this guy uh, had daylight photos of him, but yeah, so I passed up this guy that, that I harvested this year, last year, just because I was all in on that big one, and uh, I was okay with eating a tag, if that's what it meant, and as luck would have it, I didn't get an opportunity at that big one, so this one, I passed him up last year, um, started running cameras on that property the first week of July this year, and wouldn't you know it, the very first card pool this buck shows up. And at first I didn't recognize him because of like you're saying, he has a lot of character. Um, <clears throat> it was pretty easy to nickname him Muley uh, yeah. with those split G twos on both sides matching. Um, it wasn't until I got a couple more pictures on that. I realized that he was the buck I passed it the year before. And the only reason I knew that was because he had a, an injury in between his shoulder blades and his spine. Hmm. Uh, and he was missing about a 10 or 12 inch, circle of of hide i mean all it was was just there was no hair whatsoever no fur there whatsoever it was just exposed completely Hmm. and so uh, once i got the pictures on this year i'm like that's got to be him what other deer would that be right Uh, and he he grew quite a bit from last year uh the year before he was just a clean symmetrical eight um this year he like i said he put on those splits mainframe eight and then he also had a scoreable sticker off his right uh, base so he ended up with 11 scoreable points 
And this deer was the biggest deer I had on, on the property from July 1st till, till I harvested them. I ran cameras. I had four cameras on a small reduction zone property, hoping and praying that that big one from the year before made it. Um, to my knowledge, I haven't heard anybody killing them, but that doesn't mean anything. Right. Yeah, of course. Well, certainly a very, a very impressive deer. Now I, I assume when he walked out, it, it's a no brainer at this point. You're, you're trying to get it done. So, yeah, I went in there specifically to harvest that deer. Um, Absolutely. like I said, I had waited as long as I thought needed to be waited to find out if that other one was going to come in, uh, showed some of my, my buddies and, and local guys here some pictures and they all thought I was crazy for waiting. But I, I'm, then I showed them what was in there last year and they're like, okay, I get it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I went in there specifically for him. Uh, I should have had that buck on camera. That should have been a, a filmed hunt. Uh, try to make a long story short. I had the camera <laughs> arm set up and everything ready to go. Got in there, you know, three and a half hours before dark. And I got an email from the insurance company and we're going through new insurance. And so they say, Hey, can you call? So I I'm using my phone this year to record the videos, uh, especially with bow hunting. It's so up close and personal, right? You don't need that great zoom. And so I make some phone calls, end up calling my wife, asking her to look for some documentation so we can give it to the uh, insurance company. And wouldn't you know it, my wife's sitting there telling me about her day. It's 4:45 in the afternoon, 70 degrees in November, and in this area, that's not good when the average temperature is 50 for that time of year. Right. And I'm on the phone with my wife, and I look over, and there he is at 36 yards. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, okay. And I literally don't even tell my wife. She's still on the phone talking. I put the phone in my pocket. I've been in the stand since four. My release is not even on. Oh, man. I dig into my coat pocket, pull my release out, put my release on. It's the kind that you have to push in and twist yeah. to get it to tighten on. And I put that thing on as fast as you. I mean, I, I put that <laughs> thing on there so fast. Now, granted, there was some wind blowing all the oak leaves around in the tree I was in. So he never heard me. But I mean... From the time I put my phone in the pocket until the time that sucker had an arrow in him, I'm thinking maybe one minute. Yeah, it happens fast. And, yeah, and I mean, I got on him as soon as possible, got the release on, hit him with the rangefinder. He was sitting there at 36 yards behind a branch, and he steps out into my food plot. And if you watch the uh, reduction zone doe hunt, you'll see the food plot that I'm talking about. Steps into the food plot, and I range him at 32 yards. I come to full draw. He steps towards me and quarters to me just, just a hair. Um, I ended up center punching him right on the outside of the shoulder blade, um, hit both lungs, top of the heart, and he made it maybe 100 yards. Wow. And I got a really cool picture on my uh, cell camera of him standing in the food plot and me in the background in the tree facing him with my bow in my hand. That's awesome. So yeah, it, it, it turned out awesome. Um, I mean, I, I couldn't believe he came out that early. Yeah. I, I was like, Oh my gosh, he's out here this early. I, I was, I was trying to contemplate in that one minute from putting my phone up to, to shooting him. Can I pull my phone out, hang up with my wife, put it on the camera arm and get this on film. That's how bad I wanted to get on film. And I said, there's no way. Yeah. I just don't see this happening. So I just, you know, I went ahead and did what most guys would have done at that point and just and shot him. Man, that's the that's the struggle of, of self-filming and everything. I, yeah. I think I mentioned uh, in last week's podcast with my dad that um, I felt like a horrible producer on Texas Dirt this, this past week because I had a, a similar experience with a cold buck coming out in you know earlier than i expected and i i don't have a cool a cool element of being on the phone with somebody you know when he walks <laughs> out or anything like that i was just i was looking the other direction out the window and i turn and look and boom there he is 20 yards just cruising and you know just 
left to right cruising in front of me and I'm scrambling to get camera and reaching for bow and try not to get, you know, get busted and all that kind of stuff. And just it, I got a small snippet of him in a, in a video as he's walking out of the frame. That's about all I got of him. But yeah, okay. I, I know, I know the struggle. <laughs> well, I mean, it, you know, do you, how bad do you want to get it on film? Do you want it to potentially cost you to the deer? Yeah. And that and I'm not at that point yet. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that was the other thing. It, it wasn't like it was a it was a monster either. He's a big body deer, but um, he was <clears throat> he was a coal buck. So I was I was trying to make that decision in my mind. We in Texas we have this antler restriction rule where the inside spread has to be so wide and stuff. So I'm trying to figure out if he's a legal deer also, and just yeah. in that short period of time, bow trying to figure out what he is, camera, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I got a small snip, small snippet of video to show for it, and that's about it. So, Jeez, yeah. <laughs> but I know I know the feeling. So yeah. it all happens fast for you. Yep. Buck runs a hundred yards. Is it just like? Are you just sitting back like what just happened at this point? Well, so right after I shoot him, I I see the arrow hit with the lighted knock. I watch him run off uh, about eighty yards, and then I knew he couldn't have went much further than that. And um. I pull my phone out of my pocket and my wife is still telling me (laughs) to see as any husband out there knows you make the fatal mistake when you ask your wife, well, what did the kids do today to make you so upset? Because that's not a 30 second conversation. Nope. It is not. (laughs) It's as long as you'll allow it to last basically. And so I pull my phone out and I'm like, honey, I just shot a big buck. I just shot a big buck. And I'm, I mean, I'm jacked up. I'm super jacked up. And, uh, I'm, you know, she's like, no, you didn't. No way. No, you didn't. I'm like, yeah, I did. I literally just put my phone in the pocket and just shot this buck. And it was just, oh, that was awesome. And that's when you start sending the text messages out and the, and the, the phone calls and, um, you know, for me, the last 10 years of my, you know, hunting career, I, been fortunate enough knock on wood that i've been able to keep the buck fever in check before the shot it's after the shot that i get man i get tore up yep and where it was the first 10 or 15 years of my hunting career was the exact opposite you know getting all tore up before you get shot most of the time you don't end up getting the deer then because you screw it up um, but yeah, I mean, that's what I live for as a, as a whitetail hunter is those moments after that adrenaline rush there, you can't, I don't know how you could ever duplicate that doing mm-hmm. anything else in life. At least not me. It never gets old. No, no, it doesn't. It don't really matter what it is, buck doe, but yeah, when it is a nice buck and it's one you got history with, you're just that much more excited. Yeah. Man, the, the, the buck fever is, is one thing, you know, having that settle in, it, you're right, it's indescribable. You can't compare anything to it, in my opinion. And then just, you know, af- after your nerves do settle, you just, just the feeling of, you know, uh, accomplishment, I guess, you know, that, you know, you did what you were out there to do, you know, that, that, yeah. that following that is just, it, it's, it's a tremendous feeling for sure. So, yeah. And I would say that particular deer, that was that was that feeling times ten because that was the deer that I went in there for, um, and I felt I felt pretty decent about my chances on laying eyes on him. Uh, like I said, I run been running cell cameras out there and some non cell cameras for the last several months, and he was by far the most visible buck on the property. Uh, not only was he the best buck, but he was by far the most visible one. So I figured there was a chance, you know, be in the rut as long as he hadn't been locked down with a doe yet, that he'd be on his feet. And obviously that was the case being on his feet. I mean, he was on his feet. Like I probably shot him two and a half hours before dark on a 70 degree day. Yeah. I mean, that's all. I mean, that's, I tell guys all the time, don't overthink it. You know, I've overthought it before. Oh, it's hot out. It's windy out. If it's the rut and you can find time to get in a tree, get in a tree because it just, you never know when that guy's going to be going from a doe to a, to another doe 
or still looking for his first doe, depending on what stage you are in in the rut. And man, they don't care. They've been waiting 11 months out of the year for that. Yeah. You know, you think you think they're gonna care if it's a little warm out? Yeah, exactly. So y'all y'all started seeing rut activity very beginning of November then. Uh before before, before uh, here here in Southern Michigan, Northern Indiana, where I've done majority of my hunting. Uh, I usually look for the two days before Halloween, that 28th, 29th of October. That's when it can get, man, it can really get fired up. I actually had a hunt behind my house this year on the 29th of October. I had a perfect east wind, which we don't get a lot of east winds. And, I mean, I had a top five hunt of my life when I didn't actually kill a buck. I saw uh, 14 slick heads and four bucks two shooters on eight and a half acres wow here in southern michigan i mean it don't get no better than that yeah and i mean i didn't get it i didn't get a chance to harvest one but man i watched what between the four bucks i seen two of them chasing does one of them was tending to a doe one of the shooters was and i watched eight scrapes be made and one rub wow that's incredible i mean about that time of year around here uh especially with a cold front coming in it's on fire you better be in the woods from you know for me i like to like i said about 28th 29th of october from there until uh you know i would say thanksgiving but really more importantly until about the 15th of november here when gun opener in michigan if you can get in the tree you got to get in the tree hmm. wow that's awesome yeah I, I would love for our rut to be that early but we're still we're still waiting for it down here so yeah you got what december probably before the rut really gets fired up uh typically mid-november and we my dad and i were were out there this last week and it was it was warm which made for uh, a long five days of hunting but they uh we talked to some other guys in the area like we went into town one afternoon to get some supplies and stuff and just at the walmart there there was just this other random guy that just started talking to us because we were wearing camo and he was talking about how that he was seeing road activity and just some conversations like that that made it seem like it was about to kick in we never get witnessed any ourselves um mm -hmm. starting today actually is when the cold front hit and the weather really turned so i'm excited to see what my spy points send these next couple days because I imagine we're going to start seeing some rut activity here. Normally we get a, a mid-November rut and then uh, a second wave, a second rut, kind of early December, it seems like what we normally see down here. So, Yeah, that's, I would say about the first week in December is usually when we'll see a uh, secondary rut here in the Midwest from those unbred does from that first, that first phase. Yeah. Yeah, I just think there's too many of them going in the heat at once. You know, they can't all be bred. Yeah, yeah, we got we're seeing more does this year, so hopefully that's the case for us. Because last year we were very it was very strange. We were very buck heavy last year, and like with young deer, so I I'd never seen a property quite like it with that many young bucks on it. But this year we definitely have more does on the place, so that's that's encouraging from a from a management standpoint, in my opinion. So yeah. Well, and if you don't, you got to have some does to bring them guys in when it's time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to hold back on my mature buck tag at least until this first rut comes through um, before I slap my slap my tag on a, a more of a coal coal style mature buck i guess you could say because like yeah. there's this there's this one that i kill either way he's a six he's only a six point but he's got about 20 inch inside spread he's a yep. stud little six point and i'd love to shoot that thing just just because but uh, uh needless to say I, last year the rut brought in some deer that we hadn't seen before and i'm hoping that it does that again this year so i'm trying to be patient and wait for that at least so yeah i mean uh it sounds like at least in your area the best is yet to come yeah so you kind of hate to burn your tag up and then and then your spy points start going off and you're like oh man yep, exactly <laughs> i've been there i've been there before it's yeah. been years but i've been there and you're like oh crap yep you know i should have held out but i mean you know to each their own yeah for sure so first buck tags punch but then take us all the way as recent as this morning on the day that we're recording here and you notched a, another buck tag tell us a little bit about that hunt and that experience 
Yeah. Well, a little back, little back story here. Um, so I own my own company. I own a lawn care company. And so I can maneuver my schedule around somewhat there. Yeah. And, uh, right now we're into leaf cleanup season and it's, it's, you know, it's pretty hectic cause it's basically right during prime time and everybody wants their leaves cleaned up. And, but I have been maneuvering my schedule around a little bit more this year than in past years. And, I've just been focusing really hard on the morning hunts here in the Midwest. Like I said, you get into that time frame of the end of October, first two weeks of November, and I notice, personally, anyways, the morning activity is considerably better from a from a buck standpoint. You know, just being on their feet for more hours during the day in the morning, cruising, trying to find that doe in the morning. And so, since the 29th of October, I've only missed three morning hunts. And uh, one of them was because it was super hot and windy. The other two was because of work. Um, and, you know, you get to that grind where it's just every single day you're getting up, you're, that alarm clock's going off. And after a while of not seeing anything, you start second guessing, you know, was this the right idea to get up today and go hunting when, you know, I could be at work making money. And same thing happened this morning. That alarm went off. And, uh, I almost slept in. I tried talking myself into sleep, man. And I just said, no, just, just get out there. You just never know. And, uh, I went into a property here. Uh, this tag was actually in Michigan and, uh, went into a property that I just got access to last year, uh, in December. And so this property is new to me. I'm learning on the fly and I've been hunting the North side of the woods, all you know on and off so far this year i think i've spent five sits on the north side of the woods well i went two days ago and checked my camera on the south side of the woods and lo and behold i have had two different shooters in there in daylight within the last few days Hmm. and i thought okay i'm gonna go into that south side of the woods because i got the right wind for it and sure enough i get in there this morning actually bumped one out getting in which that always you know sucks when you got one blowing at you walking in but um got in there early and we had a bright full moon condition here and about 30 minutes before daylight i see a couple deer come from across the road from the south uh pull the binos up turns out to be a couple of yearling bucks and they're they're playing with each other sparring well i'm watching them for about 10 minutes and all of a sudden they perk up and they're looking across the road, but closer to me. And I pull the binos up. And at this point, it's about 20 minutes before legal light. And sure enough, I see pretty good sized body. I'm like, okay, that looks like, it looks like that could be a nice buck. Well, the two small bucks go over and try and check this doe out that he's got. And he runs them off and immediately I'm like, okay, it's gotta be a buck but it's just dark enough. I can't see good enough, but I can tell by his behavior, it's gotta be a buck. So he runs these, these two small bucks on and off for about 15 minutes, finally runs these bucks off. And in the meantime, it's getting lighter and I finally get a chance to look at him and I'm like, okay, yeah, this is a definite shooter. If I get an opportunity at this deer, I'm definitely going to take it. And finally five minutes before the legal shooting light the doe starts coming across the field about 200 yards away starts coming right for the tree gets about 150 yards and i'm like okay this may happen i grab my bow i start ranging possible spots where i can get a shot um and in the meantime the last of the two small bucks goes by at 70 yards through an opening and i'm going oh lord i hope they don't go by on that path because that's not going to work yeah and sure enough she just keeps coming coming real slow taking her time and he's just pacing back and forth back and forth behind her it's like he is just so worked up he don't want to be out there any more than he has to i think i think he was afraid of being too close to that road because the whole time they were hanging out before daylight they were maybe 50 to 100 yards off of that dirt road i mean we didn't see any cars but at the same time, you know, they, I think he wanted to get her off of that road, get her pushed into some cover. And um, as they were getting closer, I'm taking my bow and I'm going from this side of the tree 
to this side of the tree and I'm in a great big cottonwood that goes into three trunks, great big cottonwood. And I have to take my bow and go around this way. Oh, they're coming on this side of the tree. Oh, nope, she's going on this side of the tree. And I do that like four different times. <laughs> and I'm like, Jesus, what's go-? hopefully he don't see me. And finally, she's coming right at the tree and she turns and goes on what would have been my right side of the tree. So I, I move again and she starts cutting. And I'm like, this is the worst case scenario. If they would have went down the other side of the tree, I'm going to get multiple shot opportunities and most likely close shot opportunities. Well, lo and behold, she turns. Well, my neighbors to the west of me there have standing corn. And I'm like, you know what? They're going to be going into that corn. And if they get into that corn, I don't know if they're going to come back around and give me a shot. They could be in. I may never see them again. So I range her at 30 yards. She's in a perfect hole. I'm like, okay. The problem is he is beyond her. So I put a range finder on her, on him. He's at 45 yards in a, in an opening. And I'm like, it's now or never at this point, I'm either going to take this shot or I'm just going to take a chance on whether or not they come back through. And I practice religiously at 80 and hundred yards just so that I can be more accurate at 40 and 50 and 30. Yep. And so I said, I got this. So I turned the dial to 45 come to full draw and wouldn't you know it my cb uh side stable hazer bar is pushing me out off of the tree oh, i can't get man. it against the tree as close as i want to get because that sidebar yeah is actually kind of pushing me off a little bit and i kind of chuckled in my head at the moment because i was like well i've never had this happen but then again <laughs> i've never had a sidebar happen, you know <laughs> Well, he's standing there at 45 yards, and I know there's one more hole at 45 yards. He's just got to take a couple steps. So I'm at full draw. I'm on him. He comes into that next opening. Just re- It was super calm and quiet this morning, so I just real lightly ran at him. And he slowly stopped and looked up at me. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go for the heart. It's a little bit longer shot, and I'm, I think he's just going to duck because I alerted him. Yeah. So I aim Bob i'm third for the heart and i shoot and i never see him duck and it just sounds like i hit a tree just pow just and he hits the ground right then no kidding hits the ground gets up and starts trying to run off for about 10 yards and i notice his opposite leg is broke and i'm thinking well i didn't shoot him on that side and I'm like, holy crap, that went through the one side and broke his opposite leg at 45 yards. And this dude ended up bulldozing himself to go 90 yards from where I shot him and expired. Wow. I mean, his his front left leg went just gave out because it was broke. And I hit him in the front right leg down in the bottom third below the shoulder blade itself. And I, I was so impressed at 45 yards to have that just blow right through there and just break that opposite leg like that. And it ended up slicing the top of his heart and hitting both lungs. Holy cow. Wow. Yeah, it was, I mean, I couldn't ask for a better shot, but he didn't even duck on me. I thought, oh man, he's going to duck for sure. And nope, he didn't duck at all. Wow. So I I have to ask after hearing that, what kind of arrow and what kind of arrow do you, have you built? What do you run? Yeah. So, um, I like to shoot heavier poundage bow, first of all. I'm shooting a 74-pound bow. i um, actually looking at getting maybe a different bow next year so I can get closer to possibly 80. Yeah. Um, I'm shooting 420-grain Carbon Express Maximum Reds. Okay. And I'm uh, on the end, I've got a 100-grain four-bladed Grim Reaper. Gotcha and uh yeah it's it's a deadly combination i'm actually part of why i want to get up in my poundage is i want to get up in my arrow weight um years ago i used to be in that high threes 380 390 i've bumped myself up to the 420 i i really want to try and get closer to 440 to 450 because i want to have the same hunting setup out here for when i go out to colorado and i mule deer hunt or i elk hunt or right. a black bear hunt. And so that's, you know, honestly, for the white tail around here, I don't need a heavier arrow. But, uh, you know, I, I don't want to change setups either. Yeah. Man, I've been running I've been running a 435-grain Easton Axis for, 
I don't know, probably six or seven seasons now. And like the, mm-hmm. the era that I shot my, my management buck with the other morning, um, that that's the fourth deer I think I've killed with that arrow in particular. Um, oh, wow. Just, just, I mean, shot placement is one thing that contributes yeah. to pass throughs, but you know, just, I, I just, I wait for a good shot opportunity. I take a good shot. I get a pass through arrow blows right through them. You know, it, I'm out of that elite. I'm shooting 300 feet per second flat with that thing. Mm-hmm. And it just, it blows right through them. And you might have to repair a fletching every now and then fix it up and you're good to go for another one. Like I, I'm a, I'm a firm believer of that, you know, 400, even closer to 500 grain arrow. I know we just built Nick Powell out a new arrow set up and his is right at 500 grain. So it's just, I, I, I'm a huge, I become a huge fan of, of that, that kind of arrow build. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking too, because the first year I went out elk hunting back in 2015, man, I was green. I went out there with a 379 grain arrow. (laughs) <laughs> and those guys are those guys out west are like what in the world i'm like well i'm shooting 320 feet per second they're like that don't mean nothing yeah and yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm like what do you mean <laughs> yeah i got a little reality check i mean i didn't actually shoot anything to to learn the hard way but uh yeah after doing more research figured out that hey i need a minimum of 400 you know to even think about going out after a big game like that yeah yeah, I, I've kind of come on a similar journey because used to be it was I when I first got into archery, you know, it was always light as I can go. You know, I, I, I shot a carbon bow, you know, way back when I shot like I think it was the first carbon bow that uh, Hoyt back then, you know, ever came out with. Like I, I had to have it, you know, lightweight bow, yeah. you know, lightweight arrows, all this speed, all this all this stuff. And now I'm like, no, I just my bow's probably on the the heavier side of of mid range, you know, just for the in hand weight, and then uh, a heavier arrow. Crank that thing all the way down as far as it'll go, and money, love it. Yeah, that's like my setup this year. Uh, as you well know, I I I bought that CBE front and side uh, rear stabilizer kit, and I've never ran a back bar, and. Uh, Man, it adds some weight, but let me tell you something. I love drawing that bow back, and my bubble on my sight is already three quarters of the way leveled out. Yeah. And all I have to do is just the tiniest movement. Where before, I was lucky if a quarter of the bubble was in there. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, so before I shot CBE, I shot another manufacturer that that makes a very heavy heavy weight sight and everything, mm-hmm. and. You know, same thing carried over to, to the CBE site that I run um, with the the slider and everything. But uh, with those heavy sites, I was I was having the same problem. I was like, man, I just I don't feel like my bow is sitting right in my hand. It's not well balanced. I'm struggling to get settled and stuff. And it's I I too had never run a back bar, and I started putting several years ago. I started running that that back bar, just an eight inch with a yep. a couple ounces out front. And oh my word, it made a huge difference. I I loved it. I'm, I'm never going back. No, no, because I was always one of them guys like I'm going out west. I'm hiking every year. I've been trying to go out west almost every single year since 2015. And man, you're hiking six to 15 miles a day. And why do I want this extra weight? And I haven't taken it out west because I just got it this year. But there's no doubt in my mind it'll be on there next year when I make my trip out west. Yeah, man, I I had my my bow rigged up um in 20 2019 i think that was the first year i ran that back bar um and i Mm -hmm. had my my elite ritual that i had that year rigged up with it and everything and we went on that that pronghorn hunt for a week in montana and you know just hiking and on foot the whole week and everything and it was yeah it, it was never an issue never a concern never a thought for me at all so yeah, it's definitely worth it. Yeah, it it's, it helps too. Like you were saying, you practice long distance, which I love to hear that because, you know, I, I haven't hunted in Montana or anywhere out west since that hunt in 2019. So, you know, everybody's like, well, why do you practice so far away? You know, if you're if you're just hunting whitetail here in Texas, are you really going to take an 80 yard shot on a deer? I'm like, no, I'm not going to take an 80 yard shot on a deer, but exactly what you said earlier it makes yep. those 40 and 50 yard possibilities extremely yep. doable and a lot more me a lot more comfortable doing it so yeah 
Yeah, outside of when I'm out west, I haven't taken – the last time I took a shot, probably over 35 yards, would have been back in 2019 when I killed my biggest buck, and that was a 41-yard shot, and I 12-ringed him. And it's just one of those deals where, man, if I'm – like if I know I'm going out west like I am next year, I will – rarely ever step inside of 80 yards yeah i mean i will just stay between 80 and 120 and just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and man when i come like this year i didn't i knew i wasn't going out west so most of my shots i'd say were at 80 uh but i did shoot at 90 and some 100 um but man even i'd shoot at 60 yards and i almost had to tell myself to concentrate because it it, it starts getting dare I say, easy. Because uh, yeah. you have to focus so hard on hitting it at 80 to 120 yards. Man, everything has to be lined up for that to be where you want it. I mean, you do anything wrong and it's magnified tenfold. And man, when I'd move up inside anything inside of 60, it's like I'd have to actually kind of remind myself to go through all my steps and make sure before I'd squeeze the trigger because I just, it almost just felt easy. Like back how, back in the day when I would shoot out to 60 and then 20 and 30 felt easy. Right. Yeah, no, exact same thing. I, you know, I'll, I'll shoot 20 or 30, you know, to, to either warm up or, you know, just kind of mm -hmm. get back in the hang of things. But then I, I definitely try to try to stretch out and just challenge myself, you know, not, mm -hmm. not from a, uh, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm, it's coming from an arrogance or a pride standpoint or anything like that, but just I, I want to be the best I can be with a bow in my hand, especially since I, for the most part, exclusively bow hunt. So, yep. you know, I, I want to make sure that when I take these 20 and 30 yard shots on animals that there is no there is no room for error. There's no doubt in my mind that I can make that shot, you know, and, and that's, you know, shooting out that far makes that possible. And then it also prepares you for out West. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, if I hadn't been practicing this year at the distances that I had, there's no way I'd have had the confidence to turn that dial to 45 this morning. You know, I'm shooting a single pin sight, you know, and dial it down to the exact yardage. And if I hadn't been practicing, there's no way I would have never even thought about taking that shot. And instead it, it was just like, well, this is the shot. It, this is the shot that I've got it's within my killing distance and you know and it and it worked out and i and i smoked him yeah. and right where i was aiming um but yeah at the same time i don't strive to take 45 yard shots at white-tailed deer at, by no means no it, it was a situation the opportunity purely so and yeah and, and good on you man and and i must say with that buck too i i, I love deer with character i love the splits you know like like your first deer this year yeah. and everything but me, and this is just me personally i i love just clean eights and tens like that that is my my bread and butter if i had to draw on a piece of paper my dream deer it would be a clean eight or a clean 10 probably and i saw i saw your picture this morning of that buck and i was like oh my word that is yeah i, I was i was far more excited excited for you you know for for that book than i was even your first one probably too because yeah. it was your second mature deer in a short period of time too so that's that's well, very rewarding but and he's actually bigger than the first one. He's actually bigger antlered and bigger bodied. Awesome. He looked bigger bodied. I, I was trying to yeah. compare. Yeah, he's he is bigger. And yeah, he, man, he had all that. He's got all that bark just tore up in his bases where he's been rubbing. Some of it's still green like he just rubbed this morning. And I, I just, I love that. I love that, man. That was just, you know, and, you know, I'm new to fall obsession, obviously, as of this year. And last year, I know I said a little bit about it in the post that I, I did on my first buck. Uh, last year, I didn't kill a buck. And it was, uh, you know, it, it sucked. But, you know, I mean, it's not like, not like everybody kills a buck every year. Oh, yeah. But I got, I got a little, uh, you know, got a little spoiled, got a little lucky there, you know, having gone 12 years without not killing a buck and then being fortunate enough to kill some nice deer in that span too and uh man this year i was ultra motivated ultra focused and not let that happen again mm -hmm. this year and it it led to a lot of time in the seat but i also um 
you know, kind of saved up some time with the wife. You know, I told her, I said, I'm not going to hunt real hard in early October when a lot of other guys are hitting hard because I've learned over the years that if I want, if I don't have just endless amounts of time, which I don't anymore, you know, owning a small business, having a wife, having three kids. Yeah. Um, I need to, I need to be more efficient with the time that I can spend in the woods. And so the last couple of years, I feel like I've been kind of circling, like I told you, that like, that 28th of October until, you know, Thanksgiving, but more importantly, till the 15th of November, th- those 18 days or whatever it ends up being, um, yeah, I got to get in the woods as much as possible during that span. And obviously this year it, it proved to pay off. Absolutely. Well, man, that, that is awesome. It's always cool to get somebody on here with a recent success story. You might be the first person on the podcast that killed a deer the morning of us podcasting, yeah. but, um, awesome. you know, ha- to have two success stories, like I said, and this early in the season is, is really awesome on two mature bucks, but it also doesn't end there because I didn't even know if we were going to get to record tonight because then right after you go and knock down nice buck, your wife hit the woods this evening. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she went behind the house uh, this evening and I've been holding her off on shooting does, you know, it's the rut. And obviously if you go shooting all your does, you, what's going to bring them bucks in. But, uh, you know, she's a newer hunter and she doesn't have the experience that, uh, that some of us that have been doing it for a long time have. And, and I told her, I said, you know what, just whatever you want to shoot, just try not to shoot a button buck. Yeah. But anything else, I really don't care. Just, you know, you need to get some more kills under your belt because, you know, she's, she's been on the struggle bus the last two seasons when it comes to archery. And, uh, the first four years she shot one doe every year and found it right away, quick, clean shots. And in the last two years, she's made a couple bad shots and, uh, wasn't able to retrieve the game. Uh, Luckily, we had proof that both of them actually lived. We actually did get trail cameras to confirm both situations. Uh, so that's that's obviously a blessing. Um, but, uh, you know, she's been getting real hard on herself, just getting down on herself. And, and so to her go out tonight, make a 31-yard shot on a nice mature doe behind the house with her compound bow, Man, I was tickled pink for her. She was super excited. She watched it go down. So there wasn't even a question on whether or not she'd made a good shot. Yeah. Watched it go down and said, I I mean, it might have went 80 yards. So that just, that's why we were able to make this happen. We just drove the tractor right to it, <laughs> put it in the bucket, came up, gutted it, took a shower, and here we are on the podcast. So. <laughs> Came right into it. Yeah, I, I was texting you. I was like, hey, man, if we got to move it tomorrow night, that's fine. Because, you know, I'm, you're sending pictures to the group text and everything, and everybody's excited. I'm th- and, you know, I'm excited, too. And I'm thinking, man, he's, he's not going to have time to record tonight. He's going to be busy cutting that deer up. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, got the, I got a butcher shop in my own garage. And so um, I've got everything I need to butcher. Yeah. So my buck is already skin quartered and hung in in a cooler i got a cooler big enough that you could get at least two maybe three deer in there awesome and so once we're done with this podcast we'll get that one skinned quartered and in that cooler perfect yeah this is my uh this is my first year just 100 percent every deer with everything doing all of my own processing and everything so um, I'm new stepping into that. I don't have a cooler that you can hang deer in. So um, I, have to, I have to be a little, what's that? You can't hang like a full deer. You have to, you have to quarter it. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I don't have, things worth it. yeah, I don't, I don't have that luxury just yet. So I have yeah. to make do with what I got and be a little quicker on the draw. But um, it's, it's a, it's a humbling yet rewarding experience doing your own, your own processing and everything. And, yes. and I'm, I'm enjoying learning that for sure. So, well, the prices in this area have doubled. Well, I mean, everything's doubled, let's be honest, but you know, the prices on, um, on whitetail processing here in our area has doubled. And I've been processing my own for years long before, even when it was like 60 bucks to get one process, I was doing it. Right. And it's just, I like knowing how it was processed, how the meat was taken care of. 
and I and it just makes me feel a little better when I'm able to harvest that deer and put it all the way onto the table and I know every single step that went into that yeah yeah I I agree and that that's definitely what I'm discovering and learning you know it was that was a factor for us was was the cost because um, you know, before growing, before I had my career that I have now as a, as a firefighter, I, I worked at, you know, we have a, a shot, an archery shop and wild game processor down here that we're partnered with called cinnamon Creek and yep. really good folks. And I work there in both the archery shop and then later on the wild game processor. So, um, I, I was very comfortable taking my deer there and I know that they do good work and do a good job, but you know, just the cost and everything was the big driving factor for us this year. My wife and I were like, you know what, this is where we're going to try to save some money this fall. And we're going to bite the bullet and do it all ourselves. Finally, like we've been talking about doing for years. So we finally committed to it and yeah, uh, it's, it's made for some, uh, some long evenings, but I don't mind. Yeah. It's all right. Well, it's, it's rewarding when yeah. those packages go into the freezer. Yeah. Yeah, I actually just bought a new freezer yesterday because my uh, my old chest freezer went out. So I was putting, we have two freezers in our garage. So I was putting all my meat and my wife's in her freezer. And yeah. uh, and I, I literally, after that buck I shot the other morning, I had no more room. Like it, it, my, <laughs> my, my area of that freezer was stuffed to the gills full of venison. And I'm like, all right, yeah. I, 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 we got to go buy that freezer. So we went and bought it and it's like, everything meat wise just went into that thing this morning and it's it's already halfway full with with meat and and that was rewarding too being like okay i have i have quite a bit of meat in my freezer you know that that's you know some of it's stuff that we've bought and stuff over time and just you know to stock up but then you know half of that meat and there's deer meat that i've cut up myself so it's pretty pretty awesome well and uh, to take it to another step when it comes to the future generations uh we really um enjoy the fact that our kids yeah. will and will actually get out there my son who is now five he's been running a knife an actual knife not a butter knife <laughs> an actual knife since he was three helping me process deer wow and uh even our oldest our daughter our oldest daughter that's eight she will come out from time to time and help run a knife or the grinder uh, or the vacuum sealer, or what? A lot of times, what she'll do is she'll help her mom when she cans a whole bunch of meat. Mm. So it's just, man, it's like bringing this this whole thing full circle. You know, yeah. you put all this work into the off season, and you're doing everything you can to be successful in the fall. And then when you are successful, then you're including the kids. And you know, we had the kids out there this morning helping me retrieve my my buck even though i watched it go down you know heck yeah. our oldest was five minutes late to school because she wanted to come see it but who cares about those five minutes you know <laughs> that was way more important yeah and then you know tonight the wife shoots the shoots that dough man i got the kids ready she told me i i started getting them all bundled up it's it's only in the 40s here now we're getting another cold front coming in and and she jumps on the quad i jump on the tractor and take the whole family back with the lights and get the pictures. I mean, this is, I couldn't draw up a better life for what I want than what we're currently living here. And, uh, we're just blessed, man. Just so yeah. blessed. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more, man. It being able to include family in it and everything that that's very important, very special for sure. Like I, I know, what was it? I guess it was, uh, two evenings ago now, maybe I'm trying to remember what day it is. Uh, two evenings <laughs> ago, I think that I was, I was, uh, processing that deer and, and my son who's four was was out there and he was asking me all sorts of questions and he just sat there at the table in a chair uh, I, I don't I, I might need to wait one more year before I give him a knife <laughs> but uh but he was just sitting there for for a very long time just you know watching me asking questions asking about the meat asking what I was doing he, he was very very interested he's very interested in hunting and everything uh, already at his age so it, it's awesome to see that coming along so yeah and that's where it's got to start man you gotta he's get he's interested that's all that matters you know I mean that that's got that feels so good as a dad having your son or your daughter interested in what you are passionate about and you know, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be an avid hunter like you one day, but it's a good start. Yeah, absolutely. 
no i uh good friend of mine named chester barnes he always uh puts it he always said it a very very good way he said my kids when they grow up he said they might never uh choose to hunt and if they don't that's fine he goes but i'm gonna make sure that they know how and I, I thought about that i was like man that, that's a really good way to good way to put it the the passion will come along as it may but at least they will know how to do it so yeah yeah because my uh my boy he's our middle child we got an eight a five and a two and he has been very interested for a couple of years now and he's tagged along with me for uh, a handful of hunts he's actually been along for two successful uh doe harvests and man he gets fired up and i feel pretty confident that he's gonna want to hunt um but our oldest daughter she is actually starting to show some interest now we you know she's gonna be nine here in just a few months and she hasn't really shown much interest but she actually went with her mom uh behind the house here the other night and was all kinds of excited because they saw a buck chasing some does and you know she was mom shoot one shoot one but you know she didn't get an opportunity and she was kind of bummed that she didn't but at the same time she came to the house all excited to tell me about it and we're not used to that with her so you know our approach has been we don't want to we don't want to push on them to be hunters but we want to include them in the hunt yeah whether that's the retrieve of the game whether that's the processing of the game the canning the butchering um planting food plots my boy goes with me almost every time to help throw the seeds out we can always tell where he threw them there's uh, patches of 400 seeds growing in one spot <laughs> you know, you can tell him, oh, planted that that patch over there but uh i mean it's so rewarding yeah for sure absolutely i couldn't agree more you uh so you mentioned kind of segue into another thing i want to talk to you about before we wrap up our time um you mentioned your your food plots and stuff and i know you had some content in our off season series um and then kind of leading into that uh that uh reduction zone kill that you referenced a few times as well um about your your property and some of the the management tactics and stuff that you've that you've done out there um how's how's all that paying off how how are things looking at this point now that we are actually actually into the season yeah um i would say pretty good um between my wife and i we have harvested uh well i've harvested the two bucks and then i harvested that doe in the reduction zone and then she just harvested a doe tonight so we've harvested four deer two bucks two does three of four were shot on one of the food plots awesome. or on a food plot that i planted um the doe she shot tonight was on the food plot here behind the house that you've seen some content from where i plant some screening yeah and got the brassicas mostly in there with uh with another blend of some peas and some beans and some oats and that's where she shot that doe tonight and uh yeah i would say you know it's really paid off um here behind the house, all the management work that I've been doing, when it whether it's planting switchgrass, maintaining switchgrass with fires, um, hinge cutting, TSI with uh, taking down uh, forked trees or leaners, trying to open up that canopy, um, you know, introducing a water hole to a dry area. You know, our whole property is dry. There's the closest water is. Uh, one, cl one neighbor has a pond, but it's right up by the road. Other than that, you got to go three quarters to a mile in any direction to find actual water source. Mm. And so, you know, we introduced some water holes, um, food plots, like, like we said, um, and then just creating travel corridors through, through all of it to try and locate or have the deer go through where we want them to. And it's made a huge difference. Uh, in 23 years combined i saw one buck that i wanted to shoot and i shot him in 2020 now this year i've already seen two with my own eyes and i have as many as five on camera that are big enough that i'd like to harvest and uh i didn't have a single buck last year that i wanted to harvest and you know i'd like to think that some of it has to do with all this hard work that we're putting in yeah for sure you you got my you got my gears grinding for sure on on 
some stuff that we can do out of, out of our place that we, that we're working on, you know, it's a work in progress for us, but what, uh, so when you talk about opening up, opening up the canopy or, um, I, I guess more talking about the, the creating travel corridors, let's, we'll focus on that real quick here. Um, what kind, what kind of brush makes up y'all's the, the thickness to where you're, you're creating those paths and, or piggybacking off of that? What do you look for, um, when you're trying to figure out where to place one, of place one of those travel corridors? Well, first of all, on our property, just because we're limited on size, I focus around the best spots to hang my stands. And then, and the reason I go off a of best spot to hang my stand, first and foremost, is, is access. Can I get in? Can I get out clean? Mm -hmm. If I cannot get out and get in clean, I don't put a stand there unless it's a rut only. I'm going in on a day that I feel is 50 50. I'm going to get a shooter in here because I know I might blow it up afterwards. Right. Um, and I do have one set like that on our property and it is back in my sanctuary where I normally don't go. Um, and that's where I saw the two shooters, uh, on the 29th of October and actually got out without blowing any deer out. So was very fortunate. Um, but number one for me is key is access. I, I preach access so much. If I cannot get into a spot clean, I won't hunt it. It's not worth it to me. I don't think it's worth it to me to blow out all these deer and educate all these deer. Um, so first of all, I will pick a spot where I can get in and out. And then once I've located that, that's when I will try and make my travel corridor around that tree so for a certain wind. So here on the way our property sets up, I'm looking for west winds blowing to the east. Just about any west wind, um, preferably a northwest wind or a straight west. And then also I try and set up for north winds because in our area I've noticed if you either got a west or a northwest wind or a straight north, usually equals good deer hunting. That usually includes a cold front of some sort. So I'll try and set my travel corridors up so I can access in from the east into my stands. And then once the wind is blowing, I'm not trying to set the deer up to get in an area where they're going to get downwind to me. Yeah. Um, in this area here, we've got a mixed hardwoods of maple, oak, and cherry. That's the name main three that make up our property and in, in, in this area in general. Um, You'll find a few walnuts and a few hickories, um, but for the most part, it's maple, um, oak, and cherry. And so I had the woods logged out in 2019 because when we first bought this property in June of 2019 is when we closed on it, I could literally look through for 150 yards in June, and it looked like a park. There's no deer going to want to stay in this. They're just going to want to move through it. I told my wife, I said, this is as thick as it's going to get the entire year. It's June. Everything's green. There's leaves everywhere. And I can stand here at eye level and I can see 150 yards through the woods. That's yeah. not going to cut. And so I had the property logged down August of that year and instantly put side cover down with the leaving all the tops. And it went from being able to see 150 yards to being able to see 50 at most. And so then that next winter I came in and I cut some more trees down that the, that the uh, loggers didn't want because they weren't big enough. And I took some more of those out because I wanted to get an 80, 20 canopy. I wanted to have 80% of my canopy opened up in the areas that I wanted to be thick for sanctuary. Yeah. And I wanted 20% standing. And so that's what I strive for. And I'm, I'm pretty close to that for the most part, but now three years later it is it has gotten so thick that in the summertime in june mind you when you're not hunting but when it's at its thickest 10 yards maybe wow i can see and now right now it 100 percent leaves are gone here in the midwest i can see if i'm on the ground i can see maybe 50 yards at most yeah and that's good because given considering what I had to what I'm at now, 
we are we are actually seeing deer bedding on the ground. Like I said, we only own eight and a half acres here behind the house, and we're we're seeing anywhere between five and ten deer standing up and in the bedding areas and working their way out that they weren't there before there wasn't any cover for them and so i'm going through in these areas that are starting to get super thick i'm getting a lot of briar regeneration i'm getting a lot of new tree growth regeneration uh some some grasses starting to grow up and i'm going through with my tractor and my chainsaw and i'm i'm cutting at most ATV wide travel corridors at most mm-hmm. that's the widest ones uh most of them are two and a half three feet wide and just just enough that a deer feels comfortable going through them um but also why big enough that they don't feel trapped right and, I, and I'm trying to give these deer multiple shoots they can go this way they can go that way once they go down these travel corridors so they're not like feeling like they're enclosed they got to feel like they have escape routes right very so that's what we're working on here you know we're planting evergreens for for pine trees for future um cover and for winter cover once they get mature they can be underneath them when we get heavy snows uh we're, we're planting switchgrass and uh yeah we're doing whatever we can to make it as thick as we can gotcha very interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm always always curious, always to ask whether it's on the podcast or just in conversation what other folks are doing cuz I I feel like I'm always taking bits and pieces of, you know, it, our environment down here obviously is different than yours, but mm-hmm. I try to take bits and pieces from what these other folks are doing cuz we're we're on a long-term property. Year 2 of a long-term property down here and we're we're trying to make it better every season obviously. So always always curious to learn in that standpoint so well, and i would say i know you uh you spoke earlier this year i remember uh having a conversation with you about food plotting there in texas and the droughts that you guys had and basically between time management and droughts it just didn't happen this year and i know you're talking hey i want to try and make this happen next year i will say that there's only one property that i currently hunt that doesn't have food plot system on it. And uh, that's just because it's not possible there. It's just all ag and tree rows. But man, if I got private property ground with the kind of rich soil we've got out here and the weather we've got, there's just, there's no way I'm not going to have food plots because they're just so vital. As long as you don't over hunt them, it can completely change your season around here because you're offering them something they don't have. Gotcha. Awesome, man. Well, I feel like, man, I could, uh, I could sit on here and, and talk with you about hunting probably for several more hours and, and not get tired of it. But I know, uh, I know we're, we're getting longer into our time here and I know you still, as you mentioned, still got to go work on a deer a little bit this evening. So, um, I figure we'll, we'll take it to closing here and I'm, I'm sure we'll have you back on the podcast in the very near future. At some point, I, I got plenty of ideas for, for some upcoming episodes about uh management and or archery and that kind of stuff and would love to love to get get you back on here for those when the time comes so but i appreciate yeah. you coming on uh appreciate you coming on now and uh especially not just on short notice but after such a long day <laughs> yeah. putting, putting some deer yeah. down and uh making time for podcasts i appreciate it yeah days like today you're wired i mean it's gonna be hard to fall asleep tonight yeah, absolutely. I, I, I know the feeling for sure. Absolutely. Well, for our listeners, uh, thank you all for listening. If you guys have not already, hit that follow and subscribe button on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. We're on all major podcast platforms, as well as YouTube and Carbon TV, Waypoint TV. We're on those platforms as well, so be sure you go check us out on there. FallObsession.com, that's our website. That's the hub. That's where you guys can go to find all of our uh, educational and different types of out hunting and outdoor content. All of our video series are on there, gear reviews, educational videos, and articles. I know uh, Michael's written a couple articles for us on as well that are on there that are very informative, uh, relevant to his area, like all of our staff, writing pieces that are relevant to areas that they and you hunt. So head on over to our website, Explore Around, and uh, you'll 
I'm sure that you'll find something that uh, that fits your bill on there. Social media, all the major platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as Go Wild. Uh, make sure that you follow Fall Obsession. We're actually right now running our um, second annual veteran hunt giveaway. We're giving away um, a hunt to a former or active duty service member um, down here in Texas. Uh, we did this last year in our privilege that our hunt host is letting us do it again this year so um, head on over to our website or our social media pages it's all over those places so um, if you are a veteran or you know somebody who is that would benefit from this hunt you can go to our website um, and nominate them and there's more information on the hunt on there um, Ridge Rock Hunt Company is the podcast partner. Derek and Lacey over there in Mississippi, they do a fantastic job, not just supporting Fall Obsession, but taking care of their clients, obviously, with Ridge Rock and booking hunts with vetted outfitters across the country. If you're looking for that next experience or maybe even your bucket list experience um, and you want to book with a vetted, trusted outfitter, give Derek a call. He'll work with you on your timeline, your budget, um, all that good stuff. Um, after one conversation, he's the kind of guy that you'll feel like you know forever. So be sure that you head on over there and uh, give him a call and give Ridge Rock a chance to book your next adventure. Michael, thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you. All right, guys, for our listeners, we'll be back again next week, as always, for another Fall Obsession podcast episode, and we will catch you then.